It is officially Black History Month, and because of that, it gives me an excuse to talk about one of the coolest characters in comics who consistently gets shafted in terms of writing. In other words, we're going to be talking about the literal African goddess herself, Storm. And no, before you say it, that's not me just being a basic-ass white boy and simping after this fictional character. Before she was recruited into the X-Men, she was literally worshipped as a rain goddess by an African tribe. For a bit, she was the leader of an underground tribe of mutants called the Morlocks that she won via trial by combat. She grew up on the streets of Cairo, Egypt as a pickpocketer for somebody named the fucking Shadow King. She's one of the few characters in comics history to have ever worn a mohawk and made it look fucking cool. Like an honestly strange number of X-Men, she became a vampire for a bit named Bloodstorm. She was married to the King of Wakanda, the Black Panther, and she divorced him. They're still friends though, don't worry about it. Storm is a badass, stop making her just make fog and shit. It's Black History Month. I wanna hear about Static Shock in depth. I said I was gonna fucking do it. I said I was gonna do it, so let's fucking do it. There's a lot to go over, this might be multiple parts, so fucking strap in. This is Virgil Hawkins, aka Static Shock. To understand Static Shock, you need to understand kind of his publication history. You see, Static isn't technically purely a DC character. Static was made by a comics company by the name of Milestone Comics. Milestone Comics was founded by a guy named Dwayne McDuffie with a few other people with the express purpose of including more people of color in comic books. Man, not just as like background characters or sidekicks, but as main characters with stories centered around them. Their three biggest characters were Icon, Rocket, and Static Shock. The first two you probably recognize from Young Justice and Static had his own TV show. They had a publication deal with DC where DC would publish their books, but Milestone would hold all of the rights to their characters. But anyways, now that you know the background, in the next video, I'll get into Static's actual fucking origin. Who's hoping this isn't like five fucking parts? Yeah, this is a part two. If you're not supposed to be here, you know what to fucking do. So, Static Shock's origin. Let's fucking do this. We are in Sadler, Dakota. We are introduced to Virgil Hawkins, resident fucking nerd. I mean, sure, he's good-looking, charming, sarcastic, and outgoing, but he made the egregious crime of liking comics, role-playing games, and video games. He's a fucking nerd. And being a fucking nerd, there's gonna be bullies. Virgil's just so happens to be this douchebag with the whitest name ever, Biz Money B. Real name Martin Scaponi, which is not better. Well, anyway, Biz is creeping on one of Virgil's friends, so obviously he stands up for her, for which he receives a thorough ass beating. His friend saves him from this and lets him know if he ever needs it, he can get him a fucking gun. No, no, that won't come up again later. Who the fuck is Chekhov? Anyway, the friend he stood up for earlier calls him that night, who, in trying to make him feel better, accidentally thoroughly emasculates him. She talks about how it's just so sad that guys like Biz pick on guys like Virgil because they're just not that macho. Yeah, so he calls up that friend for that gun and goes to the docks where Biz and his buddies are meeting up that night. And I hate to do this, but more in part three. Part 3, if you haven't watched the other parts, the fuck are you doing here? Get, get out of here! This is Static Shock's origin. Part 3, I think. But Virgil gets to the docks, the legal gun in hand. He sees Biz Money... He sees Biz Money B. God, that's a terrible name. And he takes out his revolver, and shakily takes aim. He thinks to himself, I'm no loser, but I'm also not a killer. He finds an abandoned dock a couple feet away from him, and he throws the gun in the river. I know, how inspiring. It's a shame SWAT's here to fuck up that gang. Yeah, so a bunch of SWAT cars show up and start shooting off tear gas into the gang crowd where Virgil is nearby. Which is already pretty fucking bad. What makes it even worse is that there's apparently an experimental mutagen inside those tear gas canisters. And it starts fucking up anybody who comes in contact with it. It's kind of like the Terrigen Mist from Marvel. It's either gonna give you some dope-ass super power or kill you in the worst way imaginable. Luckily, Virgil gets the first part and escapes. More in part four, god damn it. This is a part four, you know the fucking drill. So that's basically all of Static's origin at that point. Everything after that is just him, you know, doing superheroic shit. Now let's talk about how Static's been used. Because for a fan favorite character, he's fucking d nowhere. There was his original comic book run with Milestone. That ended the same way that all Milestone comics did, the comic book crash. Pre-New 52, he was a member of the Teen Titans for just a little while. And post-New 52, he had eight issues of a solo series and then was thoroughly forgotten about. Oh yeah, and then there's that fucking fan-favorite TV show that everybody actually knows the character from. I think just in 2020, there might have been a Milestone reboot. 
If I remember correctly, Static was in that. Every time Static gets adapted, his origin gets slightly changed. Make it a little bit more kid-friendly for the TV show, make it a little bit more DC-centered for the DC comics, and I think in his most recent origin, he got his powers at a Black Lives Matter protest and not a gang raid. He was also almost an injustice, and apparently there's a movie coming out, but I'm not holding my breath for that one. So why don't we see Static all that much? There is in part five. I hate myself for saying this, but this is a part five. Go back and watch the other videos. I'm shadow banned. I need the engagement. So, why don't we see Static that much? Nobody really knows. We know from a couple of interviews that it can't really be brought into DC properties because of legal reasons, which is kind of like saying you fired a director for creative differences. It's kind of a blanket term. But Benny from Comic Story and had a really good theory. Essentially, since Milestone still owns their characters, Icon, Static Shock, that sort of thing, DC probably has to pay them to use them in any of their properties. So if Static has a solo series, it doesn't just have to do as good as any of DC's normal books, it needs to do better. Because they're already paying for the character, they need to make up the cost that they spent to use him, as well as turn a profit by using him. So like every other reasoning for bad decisions, it comes down to fucking money. If the Static Shock movie does come out, please God, go fucking see it. It's probably how DC is going to judge the fan reception of the character. If it tanks, Warner Brothers will think nobody wants to see the character anymore. We're done! Day three, let's talk about Icon. Now, Icon is a, another Milestone Comics character, so I'm not gonna take two parts to explain what the fuck Milestone Comics is. Let's just get into Augustus Freeman's origin. In the year 1839, an alien pod dropped out of the sky into a cotton field. Inside of the pod, there was an alien named Arnis. The life pod scanned its surroundings for the nearest biological life and found a young slave woman by the name of Miriam. The life pod then manipulated Arnis's DNA to resemble that of the nearest biological life, so Miriam. So when the pod opened, Miriam found what looked to her like a black baby, and she took it in as her own. And from that point on, Arnis was now Augustus. And he decided to wait until humanity's technology caught up to his own so he could fix his life pod. Oh yeah, did I mention that he's immortal and doesn't age? Anyway, because of the human DNA mixing with his alien DNA, he also has superhuman ability. Basically Superman, but with Green Lantern lasers that shoot out of his hands. Using those abilities, he assisted with the Underground Railroad and the Civil War. And in modern times, he uses his advanced intellect to be a lawyer. I really didn't want to do this, but I'll talk more about him in part two. This is a part two. If you've been here for any amount of time, you know the fucking drill. So let's talk about the alien turned slave turned freedom fighter turned lawyer turned hero, Icon. I forgot to mention this before, but the reason that no one ever questions why Icon is immortal is because every time anybody questions how he still looks so young, he just says he's the son of his previous identity. So how did Icon become a hero? Well, one night he's at his mansion, just fucking chilling, and a group of teens decide to break in to steal some shit. He, uh, he ain't having that. He encounters them in the hallway, and one of them shoots him in the fucking chest. And Augustus gets the fuck back up again. Most of the gang fuck off other than the person with the gun. Who thinks, hey, it didn't work the first time, maybe the rest of the magazine will. And just empties the gun into Augustus's chest. Who then takes the gun and crushes it in his fucking hand. Augustus flies after the ones who escaped and basically just stares them in the face and goes, hey, be better. And then he lets him go. The next day, one of the teens named Raquel Urban comes back. She proposes that together, Augustus and her could make a change in the world as Icon and Rocket. And Augustus agrees. Done in two parts, new ra- Damn straight, it's day four, let's do this. So all the parts of Rocket's origin that are actual, like, origin pieces, you already know. To reiterate, after she tried to break into Augustus Freeman's house, aka Icon, Icon basically scared the shit out of her and her entire friend group and told him to fuck off. She came back later to say that he could be a superhero and could make a big change in the community. Thus becoming Icon and Rocket. Here's why Rocket's so fucking cool though. Rocket's powers come from a belt that she wears called the Inertia Belt. Essentially, it's like Black Panther's suit in the MCU movies, but like 10 times more powerful. She can absorb kinetic energy and then redistribute it in any way that she sees fit. Be that super strength, flight, laser beams, being able to suck the kinetic energy out of other objects, all that sort of shit. And honestly, she was kind of the main character of Icon's book. Her and Icon consistently clashed over a lot of issues because while she was more liberal, Icon was a lot more conservative. She was also the first single teen mother main character in all of comics. She also threatened Batman once, and if you can do that and escape with all of your bones, then you're already a certified badass. Done in one! Day five, you thought I'd skip a day? Fuck that! So seeing as WandaVision dropped that fucking bombshell of an episode this morning, let's talk about Monica Rambeau. Also known as The Spectrum. Also known as one of the most powerful characters in Marvel. You see, in WandaVision, she's just an agent of S.W.O.R.D. In the comics, she was the first female Captain Marvel, also a leader of the Avengers. Let's run it down. So Monica got her powers basically the same way that MCU Carol Danvers did. Extra-dimensional doohickey exploded and gave her superpowers. However, 
However, Monica's powers are a little different. Monica can control energy. Oh, what kind of energy? You have all of it. All the energy. If it is a form of energy, Monica has complete control over it. She can travel faster than light. She can turn herself into gamma radiation. And no, that's not an exaggeration. She once hit Spider-Man before he was able to react to his own spider sense. If she gets powers in the show, she will be the most powerful character in the MCU, period. All right, day six, let's keep this train rolling. Today, we're gonna be talking about Black Lightning. This part's gonna be his origin, the next part's going to be all the cool shit about his character. Give me a minute, I need to loosen up for this. Okay, much better, let's do this. Jefferson Pierce is from Metropolis, but not Metropolis, Metropolis. He's from a part of Metropolis that if I said its name, I'd get shadow banned again. That's right, apparently Metropolis isn't all sunshine and people with the name Super. Anyway, Jefferson Pierce was born with the Metagene, meaning he has superpowers. Basically, DC's answer to mutants. He was a gold medal winning Olympic decathlete by the time he graduated high school. He went on to be a teacher, and then went on to become one of the most revered principals in all of America. So good that the Wayne Foundation, yes, that Wayne Foundation, offered him a Grant to become a principal in his old neighborhood, the one whose name I can't say, which had gotten even worse since he left. And thanks from the coaxing of an old father figure, and the <coughs> death of one of his students due to gang activity, Jefferson was convinced to use his innate powers to help the community. And thus was born Black Lightning. This is a part two, you know the fucking drill. So here's Black Lightning's real world origin. Because he's actually a replacement to the most racist superhero concept I've ever heard. Originally, DC's first black superhero solo title was supposed to go to a character by the name of the Black Bomber. What's that? Who's the Black Bomber? Well, I'm glad you asked. The Black Bomber was a white guy. No, 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 let me, let me correct that. A white bigot racist who, when he got stressed out, unknowingly turned into a black man. He was the Hulk, but instead of the green behemoth, he just turned into some black dude. Who the fuck thought this was a good idea? Anyway, Tony Isabella, who's the guy who made Black Lightning, was originally hired on to write the Black Bomber. He looked at the concept, looked at the DC executives, and essentially said, No! And proceeded to explain why that was such a fucking terrible idea! And instead went and created one of the coolest DC characters. Thank you, Tony Isabella. Hold on, hold on. This comment fucking reminded me of something. So y'all know Dwayne McDuffie, right? You know, the guy who made Ben 10, and Static Shock, and Icon, and Rocket? Yeah, that Dwayne McDuffie. Yeah, he wrote for DC for a little bit. He made Icon, Static Shock, and Rocket. Of course he did. Whatever! But he referenced the Black Bomber. When he wrote for Justice League, he slipped in a character by the name of the Brown Bomber, who was the same fucking thing. Let me run this shit down. So Wonder Woman and Vixen have gathered this group of heroes together to fight whoever the big bad of the story is who gives a shit they're not the main point. Wonder Woman says that they're gonna be leading the charge. And Chucklefuck over here says that he would rather not follow affirmative action into battle. It is gonna be a miracle if this video stays up. Vixen very promptly responds with the who the fuck are you dude? To which he responds that he needs to say his magic words first. Which are the black power. His only power is that he can turn into a black man for an hour. Vixen essentially tells him to uh, fuck off. The Black Bomber shenanigans are worked out. Let's talk about all the shit that makes Black Lightning so fucking cool. No matter how short it's run, he was the first DC solo series with a black lead character. He's like one of five characters in all of comics that actually has a family, like a real functioning family, that are all completely supportive of what he's doing. Both of his daughters are also superheroes. Their names are Thunder and Lightning, and their powers are tangentially related to their fathers. That's just fucking cool. To anybody who watched the Super Friends growing up, Black Vulcan is just supposed to be Black Lightning. He just doesn't have pants. They couldn't use him because of legal disputes with Tony Isabella, the creator of Black Lightning. But no, yeah, it's not a coincidence. It's just great value Black Lightning. Black Lightning is also a founding member of the Outsiders, as well as being one of the frontrunners of the Justice League multiple times. Before the New 52 and Rebirth basically forgot that he existed. Yay, reboots! Support Black Lightning as a character. Go read the other history of the DC Universe. It's really good. And yeah, see you tomorrow. Another day, another superhero. Let's get to talking about it. Today we're going to be discussing Lunella... Lunella Lafayette. Lunella Lafayette. Lunella Lafayette. Fuck! 
Moon Girl. We're talking about Moon Girl. I apologize. It's hard to fucking say. Vanilla is a more recent character. Only introduced in, I think, 2016? She's an inhuman with the very specific ability to be able to switch her consciousness with a prehistoric dinosaur. Specifically one named Devil Dinosaur. She is neurodivergent, being confirmed by the authors to be on the autism spectrum. And she is also confirmed to be the smartest living character in the Marvel Universe. Oh, shit, and did I mention she's 10 years old? She's had major interactions with most notable characters in the Marvel Universe. She has the personal ability to call Captain Marvel at any time if things get out of hand. She's traveled around space with the Human Torch and the Thing. Amadeus Cho the Hulk has been at her fucking house. A couple run-ins with the X-Men here and there. She's real new, but damn is she cool. Lunella Lafayette. Fuck you! Yeah. Day 8, today let's talk about Bronze Tiger. And for everybody kindly telling me how easy it is to say Lafayette. Lafayette is not the hard part to say, it's Lunella Lafayette. It's the two words together, it's a lot of L's. Anyway, Bronze Tiger, fuck. Bronze Tiger, otherwise known as Benjamin Turner, is a stone-cold badass. When he was like, I don't know, 8, he single-handedly stopped a home invasion by fucking shanking the guy breaking into his house. He then traveled all throughout the known world, learning a vast amount of martial arts simply to keep in check his murderous fucking rage. The man is a martial artist on par with Batman. He was one of the founding members of the Suicide Squad, and has been a quite common member on the team ever since. The wiki says he's a villain, but he doesn't kill and he's more of an anti-hero. And sure, yeah, his costume's pretty fucking silly. <laughs> Not particularly sure if he's about to kick my ass or tell me to go eat cereal before the big game. But you're right. But when your main love interest is a member of the Justice League literally named Vixen, no one can really make fun of you anymore. He's not used very often, that's a shame. Yes, I am aware it is quite late, but I am not skipping a goddamn day no matter how hard school hits me with this metal pole. Let's talk about Bumblebee. Karen Beecher is an interesting character. She's not used a whole ton, and a good portion of her origin is tied to her boyfriend slash husband. She's also, sadly, one of those characters that you can very obviously tell what she was inspired from. Don't get me wrong, she's still a badass. But it's quite easy to tell that she took very heavy inspiration from Marvel's The Wasp. The shrinking, the bee stings, to a certain extent the costume design, it's all very reminiscent. However, there are a few things that Bumblebee has that is very specific to her. She's yet another superhero who's a full-time mom, having a daughter with her husband, the Guardian. She's also an extremely talented engineer, having invented all of her own technology. Which, by the way, pre-Infinite Crisis, she didn't have superpowers, she just invented an armored suit that could do all the shit she can do. Hell, in her first appearance, she took on the entire Teen Titans alone. If you can do that and walk away, you're already a certified badass. Who wants to hear about some superheroes? No? Okay. Tough fucking shit, I'm gonna tell you anyway. Today we're gonna talk about Isaiah Bradley, otherwise known as the Black Captain America. So back in World War II, there was a single scientist that created a super soldier serum. He made Captain America. He was then immediately fucking killed. And apparently he didn't write down a single fucking note because he was the only person who knew how to create the super soldier formula. So the US government went into panic mode. Because now they had a single super soldier and absolutely no idea how to recreate him. How do we resolve this? Well you see, it's simple really. You gather together around 300 exclusively black soldiers, because at the time they were seen as more expendable. Jesus fucking Christ, that's a yikes. And you know, you just kind of poke and prod at them with super soldier serum until either they die horribly or it works. Yeah, out of the initial 300, only 7 survive, which is very quickly narrowed down to 5. Which is even quicker narrowed down to 1. Isaiah Bradley. And we'll talk more about why he's a badass in part two. This is part two, go watch part one, I need the fucking engagement. So, what is Isaiah Bradley's deal in all of this? Well, while the Americans were creating their super soldier program, the Germans were doing the exact same thing. And, uh, America didn't like that very much. So they sent Isaiah out on what they thought was a one-way mission. To go and destroy all the research and kill the scientist. Isaiah found out about the fact that it was supposed to be only one way. And as he left, he stole a Captain America uniform to inspire the masses as he went out into battle. When he arrived at the base, he found that there were still live subjects being used at this base. So while destroying the research, he then tried to save everybody that he could. And he ended up being captured. And then subsequently rescued by a freedom fighter group. Where he was then successfully and safely returned to the United States, only to then immediately get a life sentence for stealing the Captain America uniform. He served 17 years in solitary confinement, and somehow made it out the other side. Changed, but alive. We'll go over all of his achievements in part three. Part three, yada yada, need the engagement, go watch other videos. So before I even start, read Truth, Red, White, and Black. It is a great fucking book, and it's Isaiah Bradley's origin. It's amazing. 
So let's talk about Isaiah Bradley. Yeah, his backstory's fucking sad. It is a depressing, real-feeling look at what would probably happen if we had a super soldier. And what happens to him while depressing is still very realistic. But let's talk about some of this man's accomplishments. He was a special guest at the wedding of Storm and Black Panther. While he was in prison, he was visited by most civil rights leaders. Captain America both personally saluted and respected this man. He is the grandfather of the young Avenger, Patriot. And within the Marvel Universe, he's regarded as an underground legend. I'm gonna say this again just in case you didn't catch it at the beginning. Go out and read Truth, Red, White, and Black. It is an amazing fucking book. Ah, no, it's late. Forgive me. School's a bitch. Uh, let's talk about some superheroes. Seeing as I just recently talked about Isaiah Bradley, today we're gonna be talking about Elijah Bradley, otherwise known as the Patriot. So a lot of people know about the Young Avengers, but they know about the movie version of the Young Avengers. That animated one that came out in the middle of the 2000s. And I hate to be that fucking guy, but that is nothing like the Young Avengers. Like, as far from the truth as possible. The Young Avengers are Basically, Marvel's answer to DC's Teen Titans. And Elijah, or Eli Bradley, acts as the Robin of the team. He's the strong team leader with the least amount of superpowers. Elijah Bradley is the grandson of Isaiah Bradley. However, at the beginning, he doesn't actually have any superpowers, seeing as his mother, Isaiah's daughter, was born before Elijah got his super soldier powers. However, he later received powers through a blood transfusion with his grandfather, because that's how every secondary character in Marvel gets their fucking superpowers. He was this close to being the included in the Black Panther movie. Here's hoping we see him in the MCU. It is day 12, let's talk about Black Manta. I'm gonna say some controversial shit right now. The New 52, the New 52 improved Black Manta's origin. Fucking Christ, that hurt to say. Yes, the New 52 did something good other than Batman. Black Manta's two different origins that he had before the New 52 were just Fucking weird. For context, his new 52 origin is basically the same as his origin in the movie. Black Manta is a treasure hunter and mercenary who works for his dad. His dad is the captain of the ship while he is the diver. After a situation went sideways when Black Manta broke into Aquaman's house, he was trying to steal a blood sample to prove that he was Atlantean. Black Manta accidentally killed Arthur's father. Aquaman then went to find Black Manta for revenge and killed the first person on the boat that he found, which was accidentally Black Manta's dad. This locked the two in a never-ending circle of revenge. And honestly, I think it's pretty fucking cool. I'll explain the other two origins in part two. This is a part two. If you're not supposed to be here, you know the fucking joke. Go back and watch the other video. What the fuck are you doing here? Anyway, what's Black Manta's other two weird origins? Let's start with option A. Option A is his first origin. He was a young boy who liked to hang out at the docks as a child. Bad, bad, bad plan. He was kidnapped by a couple of sailors, where they forced him to stay on the boat for weeks on end without feeding him or caring for him all that much. It's implied some other things were done, but we're not going to talk about that. Anyways, one day he saw Aquaman in the distance swimming with the dolphin. He cried out for him and Aquaman did not hear him, so he didn't do shit. And Black Manta took that personally. So he killed everybody on the boat and vowed revenge on Aquaman. Option two. As a child, he was an inmate at Arkham. The only time he wasn't completely fucking feral was when he was in ice cold water. He would not sleep in his bed because the sheets hurt him. And the only time he ever found comfort was watching Aquaman on TV. But one day the doctors tried a treatment that made him non-feral. It worked, except for the fact that it made him rapidly violent. So he killed everybody there and went for the cold embrace of the ocean. More in part three. This is a part three, yada yada, my views are down, yada yada, go watch the other video. So Black Manta's fucking crazy. Black Manta is one of the only villains that I can think of that has legitimately, on screen, killed the main character's fucking baby. That's right, Black Manta murdered Aquaman's child, who was an infant at the time. And this isn't recent, this is like 60s, 70s. Aquaman is half Atlantean, his wife was full Atlantean. They had a child and the child ended up being full Atlantean. He couldn't breathe air. Well, Black Manta got the baby and stuck him in a bubble of oxygen. Oh, what the fuck? The baby died, which resulted in Aqualad leaving Aquaman, his wife divorcing him, and Aquaman to go down a full dark path. If that ain't the most successful supervillain story I've heard, that fuck Jesus. Black Manta shanked the outsider to death because he fucking felt like it. You don't make fun of the helmet. Black Manta will murder you for that helmet. Black Manta is a scary motherfucker and the movie did him fucking dirty. 
It is day 13 and I feel like Ryman, so let's talk about War Machine. So if the only information that you know about War Machine is from the movies, then you are missing so fucking much. Let's start with the first thing, like the Punisher, War Machine is a Vietnam vet? That's actually where him and Iron Man met. Oh, and there's also the fact that he was THE Iron Man for like a decade before he was War Machine. For the latter half of that decade, he did share the role with Tony Stark, but seriously, he was THE Iron Man for a long time. Rhodey also ran Stark Industries for like a whole ass year. You know in the beginning of Endgame, where Black Widow's having that meeting with the still living Avengers, and War Machine looks over at Carol and just says, good luck. Yeah, that was a nod towards the fact that in the comics, War Machine and Captain Marvel are a thing. Rhodes apparently likes a woman that could vaporize him just by fucking looking at him. Jesus. Speaking of Endgame, actually, it's actually pretty funny that of all the characters, War Machine is one of the ones that survived Thanos. Because in the comics, the only person to ever kill War Machine is Thanos. He got better, though. Don't worry about it. See y'all tomorrow. Happy Valentine's Day, everybody. If you want an explanation to why I look fucking dead, uh, go check out my Twitter. I made a post about it. Anyway, it's day 14. Let's talk about the Falcon. I'm gonna make two videos on this guy. The first, listing why the Falcon is so fucking cool, and the second, being about the weirdest fucking shit about the Falcon. Cause there's, there's a lot of weird shit about this character. This is the cool one, so let's go. So Falcon's been listed a lot as Captain America's sidekick. He sure as shit is not Captain America's fucking sidekick. In fact, a lot of his early stories revolved around the fact that he was not Captain America's sidekick and people thought that he was. Falcon is the independent protector of Harlem. At least that was his initial role. He also had his pet help him fight crime, which is just objectively funny and cool. Every version of his wings have come from Wakanda. And ever since his inception, his stories have been about proper social change and race equality. He was also able to personally defeat Dum Dum Duggan, which is just awesome. Come back for part two for the weird shit. Coffee, you sweet nectar of the gods. Welcome to part two. So. What's so fucking weird about the Falcon? Where to start? We could start with the fact that he shares a psychological link with his pet bird, Redwing. That pet bird, Redwing, is also half vampire. When he first met and became friends with Captain America, Captain America was in the body of Red Skull and using clay he found on the ground to mold his face. The Falcon didn't have wings for like the first decade of his character existing. There could be the fact that his character was retconned to be a gangster by the name of Snap Wilson, who turned into a completely selfish dickhead after his parents were killed. And the only reason that he was in Haiti in the first place, by the way, that's where him and Captain America met, was because after his gangster bosses sent him to a job in Rio, he tried to cut and run with all of the money, resulting in the plane crashing near Haiti, him washing up on the shore, and Red Skull rewriting his mind using the Cosmic Cube, which is also why he has a psychological connection to Red Wing. What the fuck even is comics? So yeah, Falcon's the weird. Cool, but weird. You know what, fuck it, I want to do a third video because Falcon's just that fucking cool. Also, I was reading the comments from the first video. I am neither hungover or high. I don't drink or smoke. I literally was just asleep all day because I took melatonin after going to bed at 5 a.m. Anyway, here's even more cool shit about Falcon because I didn't get to say enough of it. This one's a little obvious, but he's been Captain America for a bit. And by a bit, I mean most of the late 2010s. And his stories as Captain America are actually really good and poignant and have a lot of social commentary. They're really good. Go read them. Also, you know you are one badass motherfucker when you can catch Jane Foster Thor's eye. The woman dated a literal god and you're hot to her. That's a fucking compliment. He fought Spider-Man to a standstill, like twice. His psychological connection to birds does not just extend to Red Wing. That extends to all birds. One time he wanted to escape from a group of S.H.I.E.L.D. agents, so he just called down a flock of birds and had them shit on the S.H.I.E.L.D. agents. Man's an absolute fucking badass. Okay, I think I'm done. Happy Valentine's Day, everybody. It's day 15, and also it is President's Day, so I think it's fitting that we talk about President Superman. President Superman, also known as Calvin Ellis, is the Superman of Earth-23. Him and Val Zod get mixed up a lot, but they're not the same character. He hasn't been in that many stories, but that does not make him any less of a badass. President Superman is not only the President of the United States in his universe, he is also the leader of that world's Justice League and leader of the Justice Incarnate Multiversal Justice League. One of the things that makes Calvin so unique is he has his own unique fighting style. See, unlike Clark Kent on our Earth, who never really got taught how to fight by his Earth, parents, only really learning how to fight later using Kryptonian martial arts and training from Batman. Calvin Ellis's father trained him to be a boxer since he was a child, and that mixed with his superhuman abilities gives him a unique fighting style that very few people can block. As a president, he also has the highest approval rating since the 1970s, and his character's looks and personality were heavily modeled after Muhammad Ali and Barack Obama. Put him in more stuff, DC! 
is day 16, let's talk about a character that gets no hype that needs all the fucking hype. I'm talking about Adam Brashear, otherwise known as the Blue Marvel. Blue Marvel was only introduced recently, but god damn does he have a crazy fucking backstory. So the story goes that around the 1950s, Blue Marvel was an insanely popular superhero. In the fictional world, not in our world. In our world, he was introduced in like 2008. But anyways, 1950s, Blue Marvel is an insanely popular superhero, but he's got one big secret. He's black. You see, it's like the late 50s, early 60s, so America's not particularly cool with their superheroes being anything over the shade of white bread. So Blue Marvel is fighting this supervillain named the Anti-Man. Anti-Man had the capability to destroy the entire world. Blue Marvel defeated him, but in the process, his mask was ripped. A secret's not a secret anymore. For his trouble, Blue Marvel is gifted the Presidential Medal of Freedom, and in that same meeting, is told to retire because of public outcry. More in part two. This is a part two, you know the drill. If you're not supposed to be here, go back and watch the other videos. I need the engagement. And while I'm plugging myself, go buy my shirts too. I'm a broke fucking college student. So Blue Marvel is given the Presidential Medal of Freedom, told immediately to retire. Because it's the 60s, and even if they saved your life, people do be being racist out here. So pissed off, Blue Marvel goes to the moon, where he hucks the Presidential Medal of Freedom somewhere off into deep space. Oh yeah, while he's on the moon, he meets one of his closest friends for the rest of his life. The fucking Watcher. While him and the Watcher are chilling and talking, a minor inconvenience appears. And by minor inconvenience, I of course mean an invading alien army trying to take over the world. Blue Marvel partakes in some anger management and saves the world from an alien invasion that no one will ever know about because the only two people who knew it even existed was the Watcher and him. Blue Marvel would stay in hiding for decades until being asked to come back by Iron Man to defeat the Anti-Man again. I'll list some more reasons why this character is insanely cool in part three. This is part three, if you're not supposed to be here, go watch the other videos, come on. So why should Blue Marvel be one of your new favorite superheroes? Well, let's run down some things that make the character scary fucking cool. He one punch knocked out the century. You know, that superhero who ripped Ares in half and is a Marvel equivalent to Superman. Samariner once said that the only people who hit him as hard as Blue Marvel did is Thor and the Hulk. Watcher the Watcher once said that if he wanted to, he could punch the moon in half. In his backstory, he just casually moved a meteor out of the way that was on its way to just erase Arkansas. Also, all of his costumes are fucking awesome! Oh yeah, did I also mention that he's a genius level intellect? Man has a PhD in theoretical physics and a master's in electrical engineering. God, fuck! He describes his powers as being a stable antimatter reactor. So basically, remember Icon? Yeah, now just more than that. Marvel, baby, just do something with him, please. He's so cool. You see, when I started this video, it is the 17th, so technically I did not miss a day. I spent the day focusing on anything but school, so sorry, my brain was just kind of meh. Anyway, it's day 17, let's talk about The Guardian. Otherwise known as The Herald, otherwise known as The Hornblower, but we don't talk about that name because it's dumb. Real name, Mal Duncan. Mal Duncan is was a member of the Teen Titans. He didn't die, he just keeps retiring. He joined after physically boxing a gang leader so the team wouldn't be killed. He was also dating the character that would later go on to be Bumblebee. No, not the goddamn Transformer. Why the fuck would I be talking about the goddamn Transformer? I mean Karen Beeman. He kind of bounces back and forth as a character from being the Herald to being the Guardian. As the Herald, he carries around like a super-powered horn that creates rifts in reality and other such things. As the Guardian, he's C Captain America, basically. He's got the armor, the helmet, the shield, all of it. If I'm remembering correctly, he's gonna be one of the main focuses of the other history of the DC Universe 2, so go check that out. See you in a couple hours for Technically Day 18. It is Day 18, let's run it down! Today we are gonna talk about Michael Holt, otherwise known as Mr. Terrific. And for those of you who would like a visual, this is what Mr. Terrific looks like. Anyways, Mr. Terrific is a fucking beast. Within the DC Universe, he is debatably the smartest man. Him and Batman have an ongoing rivalry of who's smarter. Mr. Terrific is a polymath. In other words, he picks up on things incredibly quickly. He was once able to perform complicated surgery after just reading a manual about it and watching someone do it once. He's been compared to the DC's analog of Taskmaster, but here's the thing, his actions aren't just physical. He is a jack-of-all-trades, master of all. The man holds 12 PhDs. He's also one of the few comics characters who is an adamant atheist, even though his origin is directly tied to the specter, God's right hand. Respect the dedication, goddamn. While he's been in Arrow and Justice League Unlimited, he needs some more public love, he's awesome. You know, in the spirit of fair play, I think Mr. Terrific deserves a part two, don't you? 
So yeah, this is part two. Go back and watch part one or any of my other videos. Please, God, I need the engagement. But anyways, here's even more reasons Mr. Terrific is a badass. The man ranks in the top 10 of the world's most dangerous fighters. He is one of the premier superheroes that has medical training. The other two being Batman, seeing as his father is a surgeon, and Dr. Midnight. Mr. Terrific invented a machine called T-Spheres. T-Spheres are the most terrifying weapon I've ever seen in comics. To start, while they're floating and about the size of a tennis ball, they can hold up the weight of a full-grown man. They also shoot lasers that are powerful enough to knock Shazam on his ass. The only reason that he is not on par with Batman in terms of overall power is because Batman owns his company. Which, oh yeah, by the way, Mr. Terrific owns a multi-million dollar company on his own as well. Self-made, unlike Bruce Wayne and Oliver Queen. So I guess you could say Mr. Terrific is... Well, d great. Yeah, th that's the word. My hair's back to normal again, and we're at a different location, but that does not change the fact that it is the 19th day, so that means we're gonna talk about another superhero. Today, our subject of discussion is Duke Thomas, the Signal. So Duke is honestly a relatively new member of the Bat Family. And while he's been used here and there, he hasn't really been a big part of the Bat Family since his introduction. Which is a shame, because Duke Thomas is a fucking badass! He's one of the only members of the Bat Family with a true blue superpower. That being his photokinetic ability. Basically, Duke probably process is light different than everybody else. And yes, it's a deus ex machina, it doesn't make any scientific sense, it's comic books, roll with it. Duke Thomas can see where light has been, seeing perfect recreations of the past. He can also see where light's gonna be, seeing premonitions of the future. He can also see in every spectrum, as well as every other form of vision that's usually a superpower, x-ray, telescopic, microscopic, that sort of thing. Also his design's just re really good. Also like Tim Drake, he's not Batman's sidekick, he's his partner. Here's hoping you get used a lot more. This is a part two, you know the drill, go back and watch the other video first. Duke Thomas is just fucking cool enough that he deserves a part two. Here's some more just cool shit about Duke Thomas. So the Signal occupies a really cool spot in the Bat Family. Unlike everybody else who patrols the city at night, the Signal specifically patrols the city during the day. He's supposed to be the hopeful counterpart to Batman that Gotham is provided. Also being part of the We Are Robin gang, he was trained by every single one of the Robins, making him an exceptionally good fighter. His metahuman ability also does not just extend to being able to process light. He has a very specific ability that when other metahumans are around him, their powers are amplified. It's also hinted that he may or may not be immortal. It, infinite blood is a kind of weird statement that nobody can really understand, so I get we don't know. He also sticks to the Bat Family tradition of kicking the shit out of every Green Lantern he gets the chance to. Here's hoping we get some adaptation of Duke Thomas and his story in the future. It's day 20, and yes, I'm actually filming one of these before 11 fucking 50. Today, we're gonna talk about Night Thrasher. Yes, I know, that name's metal as fuck. Let's continue. Night Thrasher's real name is Dwayne Taylor. Dwayne's backstory is very complicated and self-contained and contains a lot of mystical shit that I don't really want to get into because it's confusing and convoluted. So long story short, Night Thrasher is yet another billionaire, unpowered vigilante that uses weapon and tech to fight crime. However, Night Thrasher does have a good couple of things that make him unique. First of all, all of his suits are awesome. And yes, before you ask, that is a skateboard. Night Thrasher actually uses an armored skateboard in his fighting. Much like Nightwing, he fights mostly with the scrimmage sticks. However, unlike the Bat Family, most of his suits are super armored. Night Thrasher is also a founding member of the New Warriors. He also heads a foundation dedicated to curing cancer, so that's just cool. Much like Batman, he's also adopted multiple superhero kids. So yeah, Night Thrasher may be small, but he is a badass. All right, it's day 21. Let's talk superheroes. Today, I want to talk about Luke Cage. Not about his origin or anything. The Netflix show gets his origin pretty good. Just go and watch that if you want to get that info. Instead, I want to talk about two stories from Luke Cage specifically that make him so just fucking great. If you don't know, Luke Cage is a superhero with invulnerable skin and super strength. Let me sum up his personality with these two stories. Story number one. Luke Cage is a hero for hire, meaning he will do heroics, just you gotta pay the motherfucker. Basically a mercenary, but for the good guys. Sometimes, because Doctor Doom once paid him to do a job. Or more, he was supposed to pay him to do a job, and then didn't pay him to do the job. Instead, Doc Doom fucked off to his home country of Liberia, where Luke Cage 
Cage couldn't touch him. Or so he thought, because Luke Cage then broke every international law and just marched straight into a foreign country and tried to fight its dictator with his bare hands because he stiffed him out of money. Second story in part two. This is a part two. If you're not supposed to be here, go back and watch part one. Come on, this is TikTok. You know the drill. Stories why Luke Cage is a badass, part two. Would you like to know how this man met his wife? He met his wife cursing out Donald Trump. This is the mid-2000s, so this is when people thought of Donald Trump more as a media personality and less as a politician, as things fucking should be. But anyway, Donald was out in his limo, just, you know, causing havoc as usual. And his limo had stopped in the middle of the road for some reason. Well, the problem is that there was an ambulance with its sirens on trying to get by him. And he just wouldn't fucking move. So Luke Cage just casually walks up and just picks up his limo. I don't mean he picks up the front end of the limo. I mean the whole thing fucking car. The ambulance safely passes by, and Luke Cage drops the fucking car on the ground. Donnie Boy gets out and goes, I I I'll sue the- And Luke casually says, get your ass back in the car! So he gets his ass the fuck back in the car. And Jessica Jones saw the whole thing. It's day 22, I don't feel like doing this in the middle of the fucking night, so we're doing it super early in the morning. Let's talk about Goliath. Specifically, Bill Foster Goliath. So Bill Foster is kind of one of those background characters that's been in the background of most major events, but just hasn't really been an active participant. He's actually the college sweetheart of Claire Temple, who is Luke Cage's ex-girlfriend. For those of you who don't know, Claire Temple is the night nurse in the Marvel Netflix shows. Bill actually has a PhD in biochemistry from Caltech, and he is so brilliant in his field that he was able to independently recreate Pym particles after just working with Hank Pym. And with said Pym particles, he took up the name of Black Goliath later changing it to Giant Man, and then later shortening it to Just Goliath. Sadly, he was one of the only characters to have died in the superhero Civil War, being killed by a Thor clone called Ragnarok created by Tony Stark. His death was actually a major turning point in the Civil War, making many characters switch from Iron Man's side to Captain America's. I have more to say about Bill Foster, so come back for a part two. I done gone done and did a part two, so go back and watch the other videos, because I'm fucking tired. Here's some more interesting shit about Bill Foster. First things first, the man has just no style. Look, I know I'm sorry I'm supposed to be celebrating the character, but th 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 come on. My, my guy, what, what the fuck are you wearing? This one's pretty good. That, that, that one's not that bad. He's got some style. Number two is that the MCU did this man fucking dirty. If you recognize the name Bill Foster, but you have no idea who the fuck Goliath is, that's because Bill Foster was in Ant-Man and the Wasp. But he was kind of one of the villains? He was working alongside Ghost, which also doesn't make sense, because Ghost is an Iron Man villain, but they put her in Ant-Man and the Wasp, and then he helped her out, and she has this uncurable disease that only he can fix. It, it's weird. Especially considering his original role in the Civil War itself, relegating him to the role of partial villain in one of the movies immediately following its movie adaptation just feels kind of weird to me. In my opinion, he's a character with a lot of unused, untapped potential, and I think that he just needs more of a spotlight in the comics and movies to be able to fulfill that potential. I was about to take a nap before I realized that it is day 23 and I have not filmed my video yet, so uh... Let's talk about Nubia. So Nubia is Wonder Woman's twin sister, also being born of clay from their mother Hippolyta. However, she's been through a couple wacky incarnations. Her pre-crisis version was kidnapped by Ares as a child and then subsequently raised by him. So she's a lot more tied to the god of war than she is to Themyscira. In that version, she wears a full suit of armor and a helmet as well. Also, like Wonder Woman as her lasso, Nubia has a magic sword. However, her post-crisis version is just another Themyscira to have passed the test to become Wonder Woman. In fact, if I'm remembering correctly, she was the first one to pass the test to become Wonder Woman. And in fact, if Wonder Woman ever fails at her job, Nubia is the first person to replace her in the position. The only reason she's not doing it right now is because she's too busy guarding the gates of the underworld. Nubia's a fucking badass, if you couldn't tell. But her more stuff, DC. Time to sleep. It is day 24. Let's talk some superheroes. Yes, yes, I know. Jesus Christ, this camera has a front. Yes, I know. I'm sorry, but my roommate decided to occupy the room a lot earlier than he usually does, the cheeky fuck. So we're gonna go for a walk today while we're talking about this one. And who is this one? Well, today we're gonna talk about the Green Lantern that most of y'all grew up with, Jon Stewart. With Jon, there's a lot to get into, so more specifically, I want to talk about the two different versions of Jon Stewart. You see, I'd like to classify them as pre- and post-Phil Lamar, because the characterization of these two characters is very different. The basic building blocks of the characters are still the same, 
They're both former Marine, now architects, that use their position as a Green Lantern to talk about racism in their community. They're both very willing to throw down with authority if they don't morally agree with what they're doing. And they're both written as used as kind of the morally left counterpoint to Hal Jordan's staunch conservatism. But pre and post Justice League, Jon Stewart's a very different character. Let's talk about him in part two. This is a part two. If you're not supposed to be here, go back and watch part one. It also explains why I'm outside, given it's still at nighttime so my vampire skin doesn't burst into fucking flames. But anyway, what's the difference between pre and post Justice League Jon Stewart? Well, pre-Justice League Jon Stewart, Jon Stewart kind of acted a little bit more sarcastic? Let's put it this way, he seemed like the partner in the buddy cop movie that's supposed to make jokes. If Green Lantern was Lethal Weapon, then Jon Stewart was Mel Gibson. If that makes any sense. My phone died, we're inside now. Jon's kind of buddy cop aesthetic kind of faded after Phil Lamar got cast, though. Because while Phil Lamar definitely can do comedic, if your character can have this voice... Think so. Well, everything's back to normal. You were goddamn well gonna take it. And that sort of stern confidence carried over into his characterization from that point on. Everybody knew this Jon Stewart, so everybody assumed the comics version was the same. More info on this in part three. This is part three, you know the drill. So what particularly was the difference between the two characterizations of Jon Stewart? Well, he went from sort of this comedic, sarcastic, buddy cop sort of feel, to more so coming across as the adult. Like, out of all of the Earthbound Green Lanterns, Jon Stewart seems like he has his head most securely tightened on his shoulders. And needless to say, his personality drastically altered to more fit the Justice League aesthetic of the character. It also needs to be addressed that over time, he shifted from being the Black Green Lantern to actually being a character in his own right. You see, in early versions of Green Lantern comics, there was the primary Green Lantern of the Sector, and then the secondary Lantern. The secondary Lantern was there just in case the primary Lantern ever got injured or taken out of action, etc, etc. That was Jon Stewart's role. He was written more as a background character, and because of that, ended up being written more as a representation than as a full character. But thanks to the Justice League show, he was now a fan favorite, and his character adjusted to fit the newfound spotlight. Which is how we get to now. Alright, it is day 25, let's talk some superheroes. God, my hair is fucked. So today I want to talk about the interesting case of Nick Fury. Your Nick Fury Jr. Let, let me explain. So if you've only ever seen Marvel movies, then your image of Nick Fury looks like this beautiful motherfucker. And that's totally fine, but up until about 2008, comics fans knew Nick Fury to look like this dude. You can't get much whiter than that guy. So what happened? Well, there's two stories. The first one is the original story. You see, the Marvel movies are more closely based off of the Ultimates comics than they are the 616 universe. And in the Ultimates comics, Nick Fury looks like this. The artist designed that version of the character to look like Samuel L. Jackson because you can't get much fucking cooler than Samuel L. Jackson. So when the movies tried to adapt those stories, they adapted that version of the character. But then there was a problem. Because the MCU got popular, people started reading Marvel Comics. And as was shown, Nick Fury was white in the main Marvel continuity. So how did they fix it? More in part two. This is a part two, you know the drill at this point if you're not supposed to be here. So how did Marvel Comics adapt Nick Fury from the movies into the comics? Well, they had to handle it in a weird way. First of all, they had to tie him to other movie characters that had been adapted into the comics. So basically just Phil Coulson. They also had to find something to do with White Nick Fury. Because having two would be kind of confusing. Let me correct that, it is kind of confusing because there is two now. The way that they handle it is that they said that the son of Nick Fury looks like the movie Nick Fury. And then they just named him Nick Fury Jr. Nick Fury Jr., otherwise known as Marcus Johnson, is Phil Coulson's best friend. Marcus didn't know his father or know of his history up until his mother was kidnapped by another organization. And on his quest to get her, he found out about his origin, he found out about all the stuff with Nick Fury, and he found out about everything that he could do. Since that point, he's become a more active member in the Marvel Universe, especially after his pops was banished to the moon by the Watchers. That's a different story for a different day. I'll talk more about Nick Fury Jr. in part three. Here's a part three, yada yada engagement, yada yada, go back watch the other video. So I did a little research in between video two and three, and I just realized that he wasn't actually going after the people who kidnapped his mother, he was going after the people who had murdered his mother. My bad, big whoops. Anyways, moving on. So this is basically just cool shit about Nick Fury Jr. So first of all, he was both a member of and, I think, leader of the Secret Avengers for a time. While he was in that role, he wore one of Captain America's old costumes. However, more recently, he's gotten his own costume, which looks a little something like this. 
I like it. It reminds me of the Thunderbolts, and I will always like something if it reminds me of the Thunderbolts. Also, being the son of Nick Fury Sr., he has the Infinity Serum in his blood. The Infinity Serum is basically diet super soldier serum, so the shit that made Captain America Captain America E just much less effective. It basically stops aging when you reach your peak physical condition. It also allows you to heal a lot faster and gives you peak physical strength and endurance. Dude's a badass, basically. Alright, it's day 26, let's talk some superheroes. Today we're talking about Luke Fox, otherwise known as Batwing. So before I get into anything about this character, I just want to say, this man's fucking costume is amazing. Like, just fucking look, look at it, it's so cool. Looks like if Batman, Iron Man, and the Black Panther had a fucking baby. Okay, let's move on to the substance. Luke Fox is the son of Lucius Fox, and Lucius Fox is basically Batman's armory. If you've ever seen any of the Dark Knight films and Morgan Freeman just goes, oh, you need this super specific weapon that would literally only be used in one circumstance? Well, look over here, we've already made it. That's a pretty good summation of Lucius Fox's role. Luke is his son, and he is just as smart. Dude graduated from MIT with double degrees. And instead of actually pursuing any monetary gain from that, he specifically wanted to work for Batman. So he went into cage fighting until Batman noticed him. More in part two. This is a part two, go back and watch part one. Come on, you're on TikTok, you know the drill. Let's just run down some more cool ass shit about Luke Fox. First of all, you know he's an official member of the Bat Family because he's performed the rite of passage of dating Barbara Gordon. But there's a reason that's a rite of passage because Barbara Gordon is a badass who could probably break me in half if she thought about it hard enough. Be, be scared of Batgirl is what I'm trying to say. She can fuck you up. Luke, we're talking about Luke. Apparently not content with just having two degrees from MIT, being a member of the Bat Family, having Batman's personal phone number, having Bruce Wayne's personal phone number, being directly connected to the Wayne Foundation family fortune, and being directly related to the armor of the Bat Family, Luke Fox also decided to be a business owner and became a self-made millionaire with Fox Tech. Basically, you're running the mill sci-fi tech company. Think Stark Industries, Wayne Tech, LexCorp, that sort of thing. He didn't fucking need to, he just fucking felt like it. Oh yeah, and did I mention that he started his career being Africa's Batman? Luke Fox is a badass, I want him in more shit. It is day 27, let's talk about some superheroes. So yesterday I did a video on Luke Fox, and I said in that video that he got his start as Batwing being Africa's Batman. And as many of you so helpfully pointed out, he was not Africa's first Batwing. That honor falls to a man by the name of David Zavimbe. After David had resigned from the role, Batman had passed the Batwing mantle on to Luke Fox. And since David had retired and Batman Inc. was still going, Africa needed a new Batman. So... He gave Luke a new Batwing suit and he put him back out into play. With all that out of the way, let's talk about David himself. Seeing as I made such a big point about it yesterday, let's talk about David's costume first. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. I'll give him that. Kind of got like a Iron Man with wings thing going there. I can see that. Personally, I prefer Luke's. I don't, I don't know. The, the mask seems a little bit weird to me. But David... David's a scary motherfucker. I, I want to talk about David more than the amount of time I have left in this video, so I'll continue this in a part two. This is a part two. Yada yada. Go back. Watch the first video. You know the drill. So just who the fuck is David? David Zavimbe, just casually one of the most interestingly scary members of the Bat Family. Where to start, where to start, where to start? Oh yeah, he was raised as a child soldier, got a fucking uncounted number of deaths on his hands when he was like fucking 12. Damien ain't got shit on me. He was rescued from that and then kind of sort of got adopted by the owners of the child soldier rehabilitation camp that he was immediately sent to after that. And then to atone for all of the, you know, the murder, he just started superheroing on the side? He didn't call it that, it was just small acts of justice. We call that Barbara Gordoning here. Later down the line, he ended up becoming a cop. However, when a drug ring came into town, he knew that the police would be too easily bought off, so he began, you know, superheroing again! And was so fucking good at it that Batman went and recruited him. Not as a Robin, but as another Batman wing. Bat, Bat wing. Four in part three. This is part three. Go back and watch part one and two. Please, God, I need to fucking engage. I don't really have a good reason for this. I just kind of want to talk about David Zabimbe more because holy shit, he's cool. How cool, you ask? Well, he was one of the new 52. Not a character that was altered by it. He was one of the 52 comics. You know DC's got faith in you when they restart their entire line, nicks like half their fucking books and you're one of the ones they keep? Given Phobo also had his own book at this point, so I don't know if that's a really good metric. Well, he didn't operate for that long and in that time he was on the Justice League International. He also acted as Batman for like a whole fucking continent, so you know, that's cool. 
Oh yeah, also that superheroing he did on the side, yeah, he did it as a daredevil-like figure. Dressed up in all black, took two batons, and then just started kicking the shit out of everybody. One last bit of badass. After a mercenary named Sky Pirate, badass name, tracked down Batwing and killed his foster father thinking he was Batwing, he tracked the dude down and blew up his entire fucking ship with him and his crew inside. Scary motherfucker. Alright, it's the last day of the month. Let's talk about some superheroes. Today, we are going to be talking about Cyborg. Ooh, yeah. I'm sorry, I had to, it's, I'll, I'll leave. So everybody knows who Cyborg is. And everybody knows the basic building blocks of his origin. But Cyborg's origin is really fucking weird when you get into the specifics of it. And the two major versions of it are very different. So let's fucking talk about it. First, I want to talk about pre-Crisis Cyborg. The first one. I should also mention, Cyborg's always the same person across the board. He's always Vic Stone. But Vic in his first iteration had a very specific childhood. Both of his parents were scientists. And growing up, he was used as a guinea pig for a lot of their research. They didn't, like, open him up and play with his insides and shit. But growing up, he was always under observation. They were always taking notes. And you can imagine the effect that that would have on a kid. I, I don't have enough time. Come back from part two. This is part two, yada yada, back parts, uh, the other parts, fuck. So up until this point, we know that pre-crisis Cyborg's origin involved a lot of experimentation as he was growing up. But what happened after that shit? Well, usually when kids hit their rebellious phase, they go into the you fucking know me, ma. They get all dark and dreary, they dress in black, they cut their hair, they pierce their ears, they get tattooed. They start looking like I do, but eventually they snap out of it. Y you're not Vic. Vic was a genius by the time he was in high school. And the way that he lashed out at his parents was just not fucking doing anything with that. He just was a normal kid. Well, one day he stopped in on his parents at the lab, and they were performing their normal scientific duties, and oh yeah, they opened a fucking portal to a different dimension! Giant gelatinous glob monster came out and fucking murdered his mom, and horribly mutilated him. His father was barely able to send the thing back before it killed him. So now Cyborg's father is alone in the lab with his mutilated son and dead wife. What now? Come back in part three? Part three! Uh, that, that, was, that was terrible. I, I'm so sorry. Go back and watch the other parts. I promise I'm funnier there. So recap, where are we at? Well, Cyborg's mom's fucking dead. Gelatinous goo monster is back in its own dimension. And Vic currently looks like a dog's chew toy after about 12 years of hard use. His dad's fine, though. He's just kind of there. So his dad takes his son, who barely counts as a living being at this point, and throws him on an operating table. He goes, you know, this would be the perfect time to use those experimental body augmentations I've been working on. And without Vic's consent, which I mean, he was closer to the consistency of chewed bubblegum than a person at that point, so there wasn't really a way that he'd be able to give his consent before he died, but whatever. Without Vic's consent, he attached just shit tons of robo bits. And he woke up scared, confused, and not fucking happy about it. He asked his father why he didn't just let him die. Comics. His girlfriend at the time accidentally said that she would rather him have died in the accident than live on like this. Part four, gee. Part four, let's wrap this part of the origin up. Go watch parts one through three to understand what the fuck is going on. So now we're all sad, now we're all depressed, because that, this cyborg's origins just, wow. So eventually he forgave his father. D eventually. He also just kind of d accepted the fact that nobody was going to be cool with how he looks now. Just a real fucking feel-good narrative. Jesus Christ. This version of the character was actually brought onto the Teen Titans by Raven when she made the first iteration of the team. And this version actually ended up staying on the Teen Titans for the most part. He didn't really cross-contaminate with other teams. He really enjoyed this found family of misfits. Which, I mean, good for him. He deserves some fucking good Jesus Christ. So in summary, Pre-Crisis Cyborg had a very, very depressing origin. All of his cybernetics were man-made by his father, Silas Stone. And he was primarily a member of the Teen Titans, sometimes being their leader because that was his found family. In part 5, we'll talk New 52. Two Psy. Alright, part five, let's go on to the less depressing cyborg. Fuck. And my usual go watch parts one through four thing, because god I need the engagement so fucking bad. Alright, new 52 Psy. So here's the backstory. Take pre-crisis cyborg, rip all of that experimentation shit out. His parents are still scientists, but his mom is really loving and caring, and his father is just really removed and work-focused. 
This Vic is just naturally a genius with a super high IQ level. But this Vic still has his rebellious phase and instead of deciding to use his scientific mind for the pursuit of the betterment of mankind, he goes, hey, my arms are like cannons and I can throw a ball real good, so yeah. Dude likes sports, what can I say? Some of us have flaws. One major difference though, his parents' research was focused on the father box. It's an apocalyptic piece of technology which allows for light speed travel and just a whole bunch of other shit. It's like Darkseid's iPhone, so that's basically all you need to know. And this is a cyborg origin, so you know tragedy is abound. When will it strike? Come back for part six, I'll let you know. Part six, Jesus fucking Christ, there's so many. Go watch parts one through five if you have a fucking day to kill, Christ. So what do we know so far? This Vic is a genius with very little tragedy in his past. His parents, also geniuses, working on an apocalyptic piece of technology, which always works well for humans. The scene is set, let tragedy strike. Vic pays a visit to his parents at their lab and Father Box decides to go boom boom. Again, killing dear old mother and fucking up Victor. Just bad, it is fucking bad. And instead of equipping Victor with only the things that Silas had made, this time, Silas decides to just put fucking everything in him. There's a little bit of his own technology, there's a little bit of a Mesa, a little bit of LexCorp, a little bit of Wayne Tech, a little bit of Oliver Queen's shit, touch of Father Box for flavor, just everything. If it exists in the DC Universe, part of it is in Cyborg's ass. More on this version of Victor in part seven. Christ, there's so many! Seven parts, seven parts, seven parts! Parts should be illegal. Parts one through six are up. Uh, if I'm so sorry. All right, so we have fucking smorgasbord cyborg of the new 52. What now? Well, this one went. You know what? Fuck the Teen Titans, I don't need those bitches. And jumped straight to the Justice League. In fact, he went, fuck being a later member of the Justice League, I'm gonna be a founding member of the motherfucking Justice League. You put a little bit of apocalypse in someone and all of a sudden they gain the audacity. Not only that, this version of Cyborg is fucking terrifyingly powerful. When I mean he has every piece of technology in him, I mean he's got bits of every piece of technology in him. He can see across dimensions. He can travel through time on a whim. He's able to teleport so good that Superman and can't even see him do it. The nanites in his body not only repair his technological parts, but also his organic parts. It's so artists can draw him with different human bits depending on the book, just letting him know. Am I really gonna need a part eight? Fuck! I did part, part eight, fuck it. Did I seriously make a fucking eight part series on Cyborg? Yes, am I proud of it? No, should you watch the other seven? You should if you have the time. Out here basically making fucking documentaries. So just more cool shit about New 52 slash Rebirth Cyborg. Again, this is one of the characters that was one of the New 52. Like I said, D DC's gotta have a lot of faith in you to make that decision. He was also so powerful that he just made his own arch enemy. Not in like the Hank Pym way where he fucked up so bad that a supervillain appeared. Not even in like a Superman way with oops all baldies. Literally, his fucking AI, the Siri in his head, just went, all right, I'm gonna head out. And just fucking dipped from his body. Stole like half his cybernetics and just made himself a person. Worked with all of the supervillains on a quest to gain emotions. Also, if you have a catchphrase, you're automatically a badass. Especially, fuck, booyah, that's so, that's so good. We're done, it's done, it's done. Eight, I'm cutting it at eight. Thank you all for persevering. I swear I'll have a new theme next month too.